Joshua chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse 1. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast or along the Jordan heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Uh, so Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gebeath Haraloth, verse eight, verse eight. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. That's just practical. Verse nine, then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. When our passage is written, Israel has just crossed the Jordan River. We're reading about how other people perceived that moment of time, but I want you to know that crossing the Jordan and stepping into the promised land has been something that God has been working on for literally 700 years of human history. God has been working a plan. God has a dream in His heart. That dream has finally reached a place of embryonic fulfillment. It has been the goal of their national identity as Israelites during their 400 years of captivity. They have been saying, one day kids, one day family, we will step across that Jordan. We will possess those promises. And by the way, every parent, make sure your kids are more in touch with the promises God has over them than with the challenges that are in their present. They stepped across the Jordan. They were in the promised land. The waters of the Jordan were in flood when they crossed it, literally a mile wide at some points. And as they stepped into the waters, those priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, every step they took, the waters receded. God has been working in power while they were stepping across that Jordan, while the flood waters, flood waters were literally just being banked up until the raging torrent became a trickle. At that moment, around all of the hills were spies from all of the nations that surrounded them. The Bible says that when those spies went back and they reported what they saw, that the hearts of the Canaanite people melted with fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. If you know anything about challenges, you would be aware that overcoming a challenge is as much about attitude as it is about aptitude. You can have the skill set, but if you don't have the fight, if you haven't got the courage for the battle, then it doesn't matter the size of your army, you're going to go down. In other words, they've got no courage. Israel is moving forward. Momentum is on their side. And you would expect at this moment, God saying, charge. Let's go, let's take this mountain. But at that time, the Bible says that God said to Israel, I want you to turn aside. And our question for today is why would God take the most awesome wave of momentum and jeopardize it? Why would God take what He had been working on for so long and now finally is happening? Why would He cause a pause to them moving forward? Why would God say we're gonna turn aside when everything is looking like God's favour is all over it? Well, my friends, I believe we find the answer to that question, and it's an important one, in the words God spoke to Joshua when He said, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you from you, Egypt, Egypt. Now when this passage of Scripture is written, Joshua is about 80 years old. And it is true that for the first 40 years of his life, Joshua grew up in the land of Egypt. But for the last 40 years of his life, Joshua has been living outside of the land of Egypt. 70% of the people who attend a Rise Church are under the age of 40, meaning that for the majority of us here in this talk today, that Joshua has been outside of Egypt longer than you have been alive. Yet even though Joshua has been outside of Egypt, Egypt has not been outside of him. 
He might have left Egypt, but Egypt hasn't left him. Something of what he went through in Egypt is still walking with him through this journey of his life. And it is something that God wants to deal with in this moment of time. See, my friends, when Joshua was born, he was born into a generation of Israelites who even though they were God's children, they lived in slavery. All around them were the Egyptian people. The Egyptian people enslaved the nation of Israel. They forced them subjugated them, caused them to work hard. And then when they worked hard, they would take the profits for themselves. They stole their blessings. They, they whipped them with, with whips. They, they made them do their manual work. They looked down on them. They, they derided them. They, they subjugated them. The Israelite people were looked down the nose by the Egyptians. These Egyptians who would have taught their children the reason why we are here and they are there is because we are Egyptians and they are Israelites. They would have taught their kids that somehow this was a lower race than they were. They beat them. They belittled them. The Egyptians looked at the Israelites with reproach. Now, Joshua might have been out of Egypt for 40 years, but during those 40 years, all he's been is a wilderness wanderer. And this is pause for you and me because you might have been out of your past or out of your pain or out of your, your difficulty or out of whatever caused you to feel a certain way in your past in one moment in your life. But there is a difference, my friend, between coming out of what you've been in and stepping into what God has got. And God doesn't just wanna free you, He wants to advance you. God doesn't want you just to leave your past. He wants you to step into the future that He's got for you and for me. And if we're not careful, we begin to be shaped by where we have been living. We begin to be defined by what we've been through rather than by the person God says that we are. We become to a point in our life where our past just starts screaming at us, where, where what we've been through in our lives can make us feel a certain way about who we are. And if we're not careful, we can live in this moment of time. Yet the journey that we've been on in our lives can scream so loud and we can carry so much of it with us that even though God's wanting to do something great in your life, and I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has got a promised land for you. God's got a future for you. God wants your marriage to be blessed, your finances to prosper, your body to be healed. You're not gonna end up abused and neglected. God's got a blessing ahead of you. Man, it doesn't matter how people treated you or how you, your family environment might have mean or whatever kind of failure or what the bully said to you at school. I want you to know that God's got promises for you. You're not a victim, you are a victor. You are not rejected, you are accepted. You are not the tail, you are the head. You are not defeated, you are led in triumph in Jesus. If you believe that, give me a little yes. yes. But the problem with you and the problem with me is that we carry the pain of the past. Now the problem with carrying the pain of the past is that when the pain of your past is in your present, its pull will always be to conform the present to the past. It screams at you, doesn't it? It calls to you. When start, things start to move forward, you're like, but, but, but hang on a minute, I remember last time. We're moving forward, but this is what I know. We can get to the point in our lives when God is really wanting to advance us, but the problems of our yesterday become the determiner of our today. This is true of life. This is true of relationships. This is true of business. People can get into all kinds of circumstances in their life where they're just afraid that what happened to them yesterday is gonna happen again and the fear becomes a resounding voice in their mind and if we're not careful, my friends, the reproach, the reproach, it taints our lives, it, it, it diminishes our dreams, it prevents us from stepping into what God has. So God comes to you, man, and He comes to me and this is what He says. He says, today I have rolled away. I wanna roll away. I wanna get whatever thing entered you at that moment when you went through what you went through. And I wanna get it out of you so that you will be able to believe that what I've got for you in the days that are to come can truly happen for you in your life. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. 
See, that what God did with Moses is amazing. Moses was an Israelite, yet he grew up in the courts of Pharaoh. God delivered Moses out of slavery to deliver slavery out of Moses. Even though he was an Israelite, Israelite in his heart, he was free. That freedom of one man was all it took to set a generation free. Never discount the power of your personal journey. Never think, never think for a moment that walking the journey of wholeness in your own life is somehow just for you and therefore not worth it. No, 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 no. The freedom we know on the inside of us is gonna determine the generations that come after us. And so God doesn't want just a Moses, He wants a Joshua. Not just of you, but your family. Not just the now, but the future. And He says, today I have rolled away. We find here with Joshua that even though Joshua has been delivered out of Egypt, Egypt is not delivered out of him. He still has reproach. Now the word reproach literally means disgrace or shame. It's a feeling. It's, 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 it's an emotion. It's an internal state of disgrace, disgrace, shame. Goliath nearly defeated the entire army of Israel by doing just one very smart thing every morning and every evening. When they woke and when they were preparing to go to sleep, he would sound his voice in their ear. And there are people all over this auditorium who in that last fading moment of the day or in the first waking moments of the new one, something resounds in your mind too. A voice screams, a recurring memory, a failure, a disappointment, a tragedy, a hurt, a fear. Bullies and his words or something just resounds in your mind. And when you feel that, you feel that sense, disgrace, shame, embarrassment. In the inside of us, we, we, we get to that memory and then we're trying to just push it away. But at the same time as we push it away, it's like we cement it further in. It's disgrace, it's shame. It brings with it feelings of unworthiness. It brings with it an, an, a nagging doubt when things begin to open up for us in life, right where we're about to experience God's blessing is where we just feel, it's not gonna happen for me. It's, it's, it's reproach. It undermines our certainty. It causes a confusion when blessing comes our way. And Joshua is living with this feeling that says to him, you are a slave. You are a nobody. You are not up to the task. You can't do this. And so God comes to him and he says, Joshua, you are not a slave, you are a son. You are not the tail, you are the head. You are not a failure, you are a winner. And God is wanting to speak to you and me, my friend, wherever reproach has found its way into our lives. If Joshua struggled with reproach, it leads me to believe that everybody in this room, we're all struggling with reproach. And the thing that God is wanting to do in our lives is to get the reproach back out of us. See, here's the thing about reproach. It lives in our lives unwarranted. There was no reason for Joshua to feel that reproach had a place. There's no reason for you to feel like reproach had its place. When you become a follower of Jesus, my friends, God doesn't accept your past, He forgives it. He doesn't just let you move beyond it. He forgets it. So when we're rehearsing things from our past, we've got to remember that we're rehearsing it, but God's forgotten it. We're reminding ourselves about what God can't even remember. And my friends, what we do is we anchor our lives to something God never wanted us to be anchored to. And He's saying, I want you to do the same thing that I've done for you. Forgive and forget. Release what has gone on in the past so that you can step forward into what God's got. Right. The truth is, my friend, in every person's life in this room, if reproach is in us, and I believe it is, it exists there unwarranted. So the question we've got to answer, I guess, is well, how did it get there? Well, there are two ways that reproach finds its way into our lives. Here's the first one, the path that you're on. Because everybody in this room is on a journey. And God wants to get you to a point in your life where your journey really begins to give God glory. But here's the thing about your journey. There is no direct pathway that excludes the possibility of difficulty happening to you that will get you to where God wants you in life. If God's gonna take you somewhere, then my friend, that is going to bring with it the possibility that other people are gonna look at that journey. 
and they're going to label you as reproach. God had to take Israel through Egypt to get them to the promised land. He had to take Joseph through the pit and the prison to get him to the palace. He had to take Daniel through captivity to get him to the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. God has to take Esther through being an orphan to get her second in charge of the land of Persia. The only way God can get you where He wants you to go sometimes is to allow the pathway of your life to experience some difficulty. Jesus had to go through Mary, a virgin, but no one believed it, a virgin woman who gave birth to a child. Nobody believed it, but God had to take Jesus through Mary to get Him to this earth. He had to take Him naked and nailed to a cross through Calvary to get Him to victory. Don't you think for a second that you can walk the journey God's got for you without other people looking at that journey and saying things about you that God doesn't see? Friend, we've got to be very careful, very careful in the journey of our lives because God is more concerned about where He is taking you than He is about what people think of you. We've got to live for the applause of one and not care for the applause of the many. Come on, if you believe that, could you give God some praise in this place today? Oh man, this is why this pathway journey of like our lives experiencing difficulty, that's why I'm so excited about what's gonna happen at five o'clock tonight here at the Arise Center, seven o'clock tonight in the city as people in our church take step three of pathway because all over our church family around New Zealand and here in the Hutt Valley this afternoon and tonight, people are gonna discover their gifts and their talents and the purpose that God's got for their lives. And you're gonna realise that you might have been through all kinds of things in your life, had all kinds of hurts and all kinds of pain, but you are not a person without a gift and you have a talent and your personality has been uniquely given to you by God. And yeah, life might have served up some lemons, but we're gonna make lemonade. We might have been through all kinds of difficulty, but we're gonna turn into something good. We're gonna turn our test into a testimony and our mess into a message. We're gonna turn our pain into a promise and we're gonna set people free. If you believe that, give God some praise right now. Oh man, I came here to tell you, you might have been on a journey, you might have walked a path, but God's gonna use your path for great glory. Don't look at the journey and don't agree with their approach. People can say what they want. They can look down the nose at you. They can ridicule you. They can make you feel a certain way, but you are not the words of people. You are not the pain that people inflict on you. You're not the hurts that scream in you and you are not the opinions of man. The only applause that counts is the applause of God and the pathway that He has put you on. And if you believe God's still got you on a journey and it's gonna continue to improve, why don't you give God some praise in this place this morning? Come on. Just, re just remember, just remember, like a lot of people are nice to me these days, but I started as a Christian voluntary worker. For four years, I was a Christian voluntary worker. For four years, I, walk, I mean, my father-in-law, my father-in-law, Jillian's boyfriend before me was a doctor. She dumped the doctor for the preacher. I mean, my father-in-law, he is like, you know, so what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a Christian worker. And he's like, so where, do, you get, do, you get, do you get paid to do that? No. <laughs> and you're, you're dating my, she dumped the doctor for you? <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? You wanna, you wanna know a little bit about reproach, just get on a plane and tell people that you're a pastor. Sit next to somebody. Hey, well, it's great. Oh, that's funny, funny. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, emails. <laughs> come on, man. God, God doesn't want you and I to let the labels of people. Because God knew what I was doing then, right? God knows what, you're, what He's doing with you. And, and even when that person hurt you or that person said that thing about you, God never quit on you. You might have gone through all kinds of hardship, but I want you to know that the journey might be difficult, but the destination is God's destiny. And God's taking you somewhere, my friend. And if you believe it, could you give God some praise in this place? Come on. See, here's the thing, we're on a journey. We're on a journey and that causes reproach to come around us. But then there is the devil. That's the second thing. The path that you're on and the attack of the devil. The attack of the devil. 
Because what the devil's gonna do to you and he's gonna do to me is he's gonna take the opportunities that surface themselves through the path of your life, through the events. I want you to know if you were ever hurt, if you were ever abused, if you ever went through difficulty, God felt your hurt, God wept in your pain. But at that moment, the devil's gonna jump into your life and he's gonna say, that's who you are. That's who you are. That's what you'd got for you in your life. How do I know that? Because that's what he did with Jesus. Jesus was the son, in fact, Luke chapter three, verse 23. Can you throw it up on the screen? He was the son, so it was thought, this is Jesus, of Joseph. Everybody looked at Jesus and they said, well, Joseph and Mary got married five months ago. Jesus was born today. Takes nine months to make a baby. Oh, hang on a minute. You're that kind of kid. And in an Israelite community, that meant a lot, my friend. In fact, when Jesus got up to preach in his own hometown in Luke chapter four, so we're in Luke three, let's jump over one chapter to Luke four, four, Jesus' first sermon in his own hometown, Luke 4, 21. He speaks very well, but isn't he Joseph's son? That son? Now, come over to John chapter eight. John chapter eight and verse 39, Jesus is having an argument with the Pharisees over whether they are children of God or not, whether Abraham is their father. In John eight, verse 39, the Bible says that the Pharisees spoke and they said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do the things Abraham did. But as it is, you're determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You were doing the things your father does. In other words, you're children of the devil, you guys. And this was their response. We are not illegitimate children. There's not a commentator you'll ever read who will not agree with the fact that they were giving a sideways swipe at Jesus. They were saying, you are an illegitimate child, but we are not. You were conceived in fornication. In fact, in the New King James Bible, they literally say, we were not conceived in fornication. They're saying, you, you are to be looked at lower You are disqualified from clergy. You will never be the Messiah. You should not be a preacher. We don't know how you do miracles because clearly you are not able, reproach. They looked at Jesus with disgrace and shame. And the reason why they did that, my friend, was to cause Jesus to fall into a temptation. Have you ever read when Jesus was tempted? Three times the devil came to Jesus. Three times he said the same thing. If you can finish it, get with me for the last few words. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, I know who you are. And that's you and that's me. A dream, a sense of purpose, a divine sense of calling. Joshua has just crossed the Jordan, Jesus has just crossed the Jordan of baptism. And at the moment when he was stepping into what God had for him, the devil says, you are your past, your failure, your abuse, your pain. You're not the son of God. And if the devil did that to Jesus, he's gonna do it to you and me. He sows these questions. He exploits your journey. Because you're all gonna face abuse. Reproach, reproach, we're all going to face reproach. People say evil things, we live in a fallen world, people are gonna look at you and they're gonna say horrible things. But reproach remains external to the person like it remained external to Jesus unless we agree with it. And that's what we do. We agree with the lie and we disbelieve the truth. And sometimes it's real hard to believe the truth. But God's got a promise for you. And you're not that pain. And that abuse is not what defines you. And your promise is great. And God's got an awesome call ahead. And so he came to to Joshua and he said, we're gonna get this thing out. We're gonna find that misbelief and we're gonna get it out of your spirit. We're gonna free your life to believe again. Today, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. And friend, I believe that there are people in this auditorium today and this is your day. God's saying we're gonna get that reproach out of you. 
even as I'm speaking, something's telling you, I'm not my past, I am not my pain, I am not my failure. Yesterday's sins don't determine tomorrow's promises. God's got a future and a plan and a purpose for me. If you believe that about yourself, give me a loud Amen and shout to the Lord. Amen. See friend, I believe that God wants us to displace the lie and give place for the truth. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am blessed by God. I am called of Him. I am well able. I am the head and not the tail. God is on my side. I will win. I will not lose. I will live and I will not die. This sickness is not under death. This problem is not of my own making. Greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. Come on, if you believe it, give God some praise in this place today. See, my friends, when reproach finds its way into our lives, it will prevent us from displaying the brilliance God has for us. When reproach is in our lives, it will cause us to pull back at the day that we should move forward. If reproach is in our lives, we will live with nagging fears when we should live with an amazing sense of expectation. If reproach is in our lives, then it will prevent us from being who God called us to be. Reproach will stop you from being you. And so God is in the business of rolling away the reproach. See, there are three things. I've got five minutes, but let me give them to you real quick. Three things that will happen when reproach is in your life. Number one, when reproach is in a person's life, it will cause them to lower the level of their expectation. If there is one thing that every Bible-believing Christian should have, it is high expectations for the future. Why? Because we serve a great God. We give God glory. We declare God's greatness when we have great expectations for the life that He is calling us to live. We give God no glory when we say, you've saved me, but I am worthy of nothing. No, God didn't just save you, He freed you. He didn't just free you, He called you. He didn't just call you, He redeemed you. Every promise of God is yes and amen. You and I need to have a great sense of expectation. I'm gonna be a world changer. I'm gonna do something great for God. God wants you and I to lift the level of our expectation back up again. Why? Because you might have grown up in Egypt, but Joshua, you can conquer Canaan. Let me put it in a modern day context. You might have been from the hood, but you can change the world. You might have had people say that you can't even pass an exam, but I'm here to tell you, you can stand in the day of your trial. I'm here to tell you, you've got every reason for great expectations. I was in a conference this week and Brian Houston was preaching and he was reminding us that he grew up in 1196 Tider Drive. That's like a few kilometres. But I want you to know you might have grown up in Tider, Nainai, Wainui, Amata, Waikika, Mukau, Kaikoui. You might have grown up in Dargaville, Belclutheral, or Gore. But God can take you from wherever you began your journey and He can do something amazing with your life. If you believe God can cause you to do something amazing, why don't you give God some praise? Come on, come on. Friends, let me hear you. God has not lowered His expectations of you. So we better not lower our own expectations of ourselves. We came here today because God is wanting to roll away the reproach of Egypt from us, free us from our deception, liberate us from our diminished goals and dreams. Lift your sight back up and believe again that you can and you will do something amazing for God. Number two, when reproach is in our lives, it will allow unworthy to prevent opportunity. When reproach, reproach by the way is all through the Bible. It's probably one of the greatest struggle that the biblical characters of the Bible struggled with was that they didn't feel like they were able to do what God had called them to do. It's what we find in page after page after page after page of the Bible is people feeling, I am not the man for the task. Okay, Jacob, who said, I'm the one who grasps at the heel. And God said, you're not the one who grasps at the heel, you're an overcomer. God said, don't listen to your reproach. Don't listen to what your mother said about you. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to what your brother said about you. Listen to the promise of God on the inside of your life. You're not a struggler. You're not a battler. You're an overcomer. You might have felt you've struggled every day of your life, but I'm here to tell you, God wants to roll the reproach away from you that makes you think that struggler is your lot, survivor is your lot. You're not gonna be a struggler, you're gonna be an overcomer. Not an indebted, you're gonna be blessed. You're not gonna be going down, down, you're gonna be going up. God's got a great plan. I'm I'm preaching, but I'm, I'm distracted. But Gideon, Gideon struggled with reproach. 
I'm the least, I'm the weakest. Saul, reproach, don't you know who I'm from? My family, my background. It's in every page of the Bible. Peter went back to fishing because he didn't think he could do anything after he disappointed Jesus. And God turns up in his life and goes, what are you doing here? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lamb. Don't let the reproach find its way into your life. You'll find it on page after page after page. But probably the worst example is Moses. Because Moses was called by God to be the deliverer of Israel. Unprecedented influence was his destiny in life. Yet the Bible says that when God called Moses, Moses in, in Exodus 3.10, God said to him, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. And God said, Moses said to God, who am I? Don't you know who I am? Who am I that I should bring God out of Israel, out of Egypt? The rest of the chapter is God just telling him what he thinks of him and, how, and what he's gonna do for him. It's just like, just God just goes busy. He gives him a whole speech. And then in Exodus chapter four, verse one, the Bible says, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? He's still a doubter. Verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, oh Lord, I've never been eloquent neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, jump over, the guys upstairs, can you jump over to Acts chapter seven, verse 22? Let's see what other people said about Moses. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech. In other words, Moses could preach. Yet Moses was viewing himself. Have you ever met somebody who said you're awesome and you doubt it? Ever had someone say you've got a destiny that's calling over your life and you're like, they don't really mean that, that is flattering me? Have you ever found that sometimes there's a difference between the way other people perceive us and the way we perceive ourselves? Let's call it what it is. It's reproach, it's self-deceit. It creeps on the inside of us and stops us from living the life God's got for us. And my friends, God doesn't want you and I to live a moment longer with reproach. Why? Because He's got a life of influence for you. Don't call unclean what God called clean. Don't call unworthy what God declared worthy. Here's where God gets Moses. Here's where God gets angry with Moses. Exodus 4, 13 and 14. But Moses said, after saying, I can't speak, who am I? What if they don't believe me? He then says, oh Lord, send someone else to do it. And in verse 14, you got it up there? Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. There are a thousand ways that probably we can, maybe not a thousand, but there are ways we can disappoint God. Let's never let it be said that the devil so ruled the arena of our hearts and minds that we believed the deception about ourselves rather than the calling God's got for us. I'd rather go all out believing too much than have a life that is believing too little. How about we start believing that we can? Let's walk into the room and say, I own the room. Come on, let's walk into the day of our opportunity and say, I was made for this opportunity. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God is on my side. Come on, if you believe it, make some noise in this place today. Oh, my friend. And number three, the third thing, the third thing that happens when reproaches in your life is that you can decline influence through inferiority. You can just say no, decline it. It's a cousin to Moses, but Jeremiah, the Bible tells us when God came to him, he said, before you were born, I knew you. God could equally say that to every single person here in this talk today. Before you were born, I planned out every day of your life. And yet the Bible says that Jeremiah said, Lord, I'm only a child. And that's our problem, isn't it? You're only from here. You're only this, you're only that. We talked about this the other week. But here's what God said to, to Jeremiah. He said, you must go to whomever I send you and you must say whatever I command you. Whomever and whatever. Don't you let inferiority stop you. Get to a point where you can believe that you can do what God's called you to do. God came to Joshua and 
said, today, Josh, I'm rolling away that reproach. I'm rolling it away. He came to Jesus on the day of his baptism. Jesus was standing in the Jordan. God is about to bring to fulfillment not what he's been working on for 700 years, but since the dawn of time. Since the serpent deceived Eve and God said, you might have nipped at her heel, but her descendant is gonna crush your head. Jesus, standing in the waters of the Jordan, God spoke and he said, this is my son, not Joseph's son, not the illegitimate son. This is my son, whom I love. And with you, I am well pleased. Does anybody believe that you're God's child? Does anybody believe that God actually loves you? I want you to know that He's not just in love with you, that He's pleased with you. That you are special, unique, brilliant. And that God loves you and He called you by name. Come on, if you believe it, give God some praise in this place this morning. Come on, come on. Let me just finish with this. A woman, a woman was brought before Jesus who was caught in the act of adultery. That's, that's, that's a pretty bad sin in that culture, adultery. She's paraded in front of Jesus, reproach people standing around her with rocks ready to stone her. Jesus asked that question, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, everybody wanders away. And then Jesus asks this woman, a self-actualizing question. Where are they who condemn you? Have you asked yourself whether that reproach is valid? Woman, where are they who condemn you? Where's the validity? And that feeling that because you've been abused, you can't have a future. Where is the truth in the notion that a sin from your past means you have no promise for your future? Where are they who condemn you? She said, there are none. And he said, well, I don't condemn you. Come on. That day, he rolled away the reproach of Egypt from her.